Uh, All right, let's do it. And uh, I know we are close to the evening and uh, all have had a lot of iceberg already, but a little more uh, is always fun. So welcome everyone uh, to the panel discussion. I'm excited to chat about obviously the iceberg and like uh, Sintona mentioned about, do I really need to migrate to the lake house? Right, so the big question is, is there the urgency to do so now? Uh, and we can go the round of and maybe Martin, what do you think? Um, well, uh, thanks again for, for having me here. Um, so I, I think I alluded to this a little bit uh, in, in, my, uh, in my earlier mini panel. Um, it's a, in, in terms of whether there's urgency or not, I would say uh, no. I mean, uh, so lake houses allow you to do a number of things that uh, you couldn't do before with uh, just plain old data lakes. but. Depends on what you're doing. Like, mm -hmm. it's, if 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 you have a um, uh, infrastructure, a system, uh, and it works for you, yep. no need to do that. Like, do it as uh, as necessary. Evaluate the technologies as necessary, but don't jump on the. I mean, I, at least my my advice: don't jump on the. Wheel, uh, wheel. What's that? Yeah, just don't jump into the game. Yeah, don't don't jump on the on the latest uh, fad just because, right? It's uh, it, it's can be costly to do that. Uh, so you have to take that, uh, we are, I mean, look at it very carefully. Now, if, if there are workloads, use cases that, that satisfy what you need, uh, then uh, yeah, by all means start looking at that. And, um, and also like try to do it gradually. Like don't think, mm -hmm. oh, I'm gonna replace my entire infrastructure with a data lake in one day. It's gonna take a while. And, and there are ways, the ways to approach the problem so you can migrate to it gradually and, and carefully and safely. Okay, that's interesting. Thanks for sharing that, Steph. I think that's a very vague question because, uh, you know, I think it depends a lot on where you are today um, in your journey, you know, where you are with your organization. If you're basically in a data swamp, like, you know, previous speakers have mentioned, and you would like to get better understanding of, you know, where your data is at and get insights into your data's metadata and, you know, by using something like iceberg tab table format, um, then maybe you should, you know, start to look for some managed options for your data lake and maybe consider a data lake house. But if you're happy with your, you know, current data warehouse and you also evaluate other options, you know, newcomers, for, for example, um, that could keep costs down, then I think there is no big need to make huge changes. So I think it really depends on, you know, where things are with, the individual. Yeah, good insights there, Ryan. I will also quibble with the question. Um, <laughs> so it, I think it depends on what you mean by lake house. Um, and there's a huge spectrum. I, I love the term lake house because it makes you think the best of data lakes and the best of data warehouses, but that's mm. not what people who introduced the term actually meant, <laughs> right? <laughs> they were like, ooh, people are calling them data swamps. Uh, how about Lake House? So I, I think it, you need to get much more specific about what you're trying to do. So yeah, if, if you have use cases that, you know, you're worried about correctness, um, certainly like upgrade to a technology like Iceberg, um, that can really help you there. If you have multiple use cases and you want to bring in, say, streaming technologies or you want to offload some of your, uh, you know, workloads to another tool, like there are a lot of techniques there that, that can help. Um, so I, I don't know if the term lake house is, is the question I would ask. I think there are more specific questions about what are you trying to accomplish and where are, is your current infrastructure falling down? Um, which is kind of what Martine was saying. Yeah, pretty interesting. And um, what, what do you think, uh, uh, Matt? So let, let me try to talk. Can everyone hear me okay for a second? Okay. So let, let me talk about two big motivations that I see for moving to a lake house architecture. And frankly, if these don't apply to you yet, then don't jump on the bandwagon. And I think for many organizations that are just getting into data practices, or just building out a good data team structure. They just want to take it some, keep it simple and not jump into complex technology too early. I think. Uh, no. There, no, it's on. Okay, there we go. So you couldn't hear me. All right, let me say that again. So I think the the two main motivations I see 
are costs and interop. And we, I think today we've mostly alluded to the cost, um, the cost use case, and I think interop is closely related. And so what do I mean by costs? Well, your traditional cloud data warehouse bill really starts to explode. That's been getting a lot of scrutiny over the last two years or so. And then you want to be able to change query engine technologies. The Lakehouse lets you do that very easily. And so you can optimize different query engines to different use cases. And so I'm going to push back slightly on what Ryan Boyd was kind of alluding to earlier, which is that big data is dead. I don't think big data is entirely dead. I think most companies that have like a revenue of, say, a billion dollars have some medium to big data use case, meaning they need to run some big jobs. But I think he's basically right that most queries are not big data, right? And so that's where having a lake house architecture means now I can optimize my costs to the type of query I'm trying to run. And so if the small data query if it's just analytics, I can run it locally on top of the same data. And when I need to do something really large, I can now move over to Trino running on top of the same data with the iceberg table format. Um, and then that brings us directly to the, the second question, which is interop. And that is increasingly, we need to think about data being multimodal and queries being multimodal. So small data queries, large data queries, structured data, unstructured data, a lot of different query engines able to run on top of the same basic data infrastructure without a lot of friction between those, those partitions. And so, I think, yeah, again, don't don't jump into it too quickly, but if those two questions apply to your company, then maybe start making a plan about how you're going to transition to more interoperability and more manageable costs by switching query engines as it makes sense to do so. Thanks. I have my own mic. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm going to disagree with most of the panel. I think that there is actually a very compelling reason to switch to a, to a data lakehouse now. And, I mean, let's start by saying when you ask should I switch to a data lake house? The people you're asking are not the people who are in the middle of a, of a data infrastructure transition or just completed one. So data infrastructure lasts for like five to eight years. Mm -hmm. That's like kind of the life cycle of data infrastructure. And if you're in the middle of that life cycle, obviously you're not like, we're not talking to you because you're not like, you're not interested in these stuff. You're gonna, you're gonna look at it in three or four years when it's relevant to you. But if it is relevant to you and you're picking your data infrastructure now, you don't want to lock in. And the lake house is, is really giving you the ability to future-proof yourself. You'll be able to use whatever query engine you want. It's very pluggable. The data is, is very easy to move around. So you're not like committing to anything. Yeah. Um, whereas most alternative data infrastructures will require a commitment. And the compelling event now, the reason that like, why you should do it now, because you're looking for a data infrastructure and it's ready. Like it will work for you now. Whereas I think like if we would have spoken two or three years ago, it wouldn't really have supported the use cases to the same extent as alternatives. So I think that's like the, the compelling event is that it's just, it's ready for prime time. Yeah, very interesting. Any, any thoughts on Yuri's answer there? Like anything, Matt, Martin, Ryan, you all want to add? I, I think, yeah, I, I'm very excited to see the maturation of the space. I also see some dangers, which I'll point out, which is that, there's a risk of what I'll call the proprietary data lake house. And that is, so, so certain vendors in the space have come in and started using Iceberg, which is great. I really appreciate that. But then they're putting a proprietary layer over the top of it, so it becomes less interoperable. And so I would say, as an industry, we should really push back against it, that and say, no, it's great that you're joining the coalition, but you need to make it writable. Like, it's not okay to just have you control the data and not a, any, let anyone else do that. And I think if we can move forward as an industry, then really the lake house concept can become much better and more interoperable, which it already has since the Hadoop days, I feel like. Yeah, I, th I think that also, like, a lot of... Like, even though people are trying, I mean, we're talking about this, like, you know, unnamed vendor, but, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but like the, uh, like, even though they're trying to wall it off, I think that, that the fact that the format is open and there's a lot of pressure from the industry, I do think that it's going to open up. Like we had a conversation about that just, just a few moments ago, we were saying that they're, they're not going to have a choice. So like, if you pick that format, it's gonna, even if it's not, even if you pick the catalog to be closed, it will open up eventually, probably. So I, I do find your perspective pretty interesting here that it's ready. Um, I think though that I, I'm trying to convince myself that that's correct, and I'm just not quite there. Like I, I don't that's think scary I'm the one that gets you. to choose. <laughs> <laughs> 
I, I don't think that I'm the one that gets to say, hey, it's ready for, for you, person that would previously buy a cloud data warehouse and be perfectly happy um, un until we get to those deeper questions that thank you, you enumerated, right? Like, do you have multiple use cases? Is there, you know, some cost challenge that you're, you're trying to work around? Um, I, I think that the market will tell us that. And I, I certainly would tell people that in sales meetings, but <laughs> like, um, like it's there for me, definitely. So I agree with that. But I, I think that um, it'll be interesting to see if that's really what takes off. Is it truly that we've gotten, we've gotten to the point where um, the, the best practice is, you know, buy separate compute and storage and like multiple compute vendors, that's, that's actually, you know, quite a, a difficult thing to do. Yeah, Martin wants to add something. Uh, yeah, I, I kind of agree with uh, what uh, Ryan was saying. So the, it feels like a lot of things are ready, at least for um, like when you look at uh, things piecewise. But the, I think the ecosystem is still very fragmented. And for someone that is not in this space, like day in, day out, working on infrastructure, on building, putting all these components together, it's very challenging. So it's very challenging to navigate. So just saying, uh, telling someone, oh, go on and switch everything to a data lake, is like, well, where do they even start? How do I pick? How do I, do I run multiple query engines? Do I run multiple table formats just in case one of them wins? Like, I mean, the reality is there's still a bunch of competing uh, table formats. So which one do you pick? Uh, pick the wrong one, and then you're going to be stuck, stuck with that for the next uh, uh, five, 10 years. So it, it is, um, I, think, I, I think, yeah, the industry has been evolving over the last few years, but there's still, there's still uh, some, some ways to go before uh, we can tell anyone out there that is not familiar with uh, or uh, intimately familiar with everything that's going on to, oh, this is the right way to do everything. Yeah, I wonder, because it's like, I mean, I, I feel like we're all being very careful not to make forward-looking statements, but can't we already say, like, which, which format won? Can I plug my talk? <laughs> <laughs> my talk is all about wild predictions, so stay, stay around for that. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that's awesome. I think uh, we have various uh, thoughts around it, and that's the fun of having like six people on the panel and uh, you know five people now. Uh, Joe left, but uh, Shantana, thanks for putting them together and have like various discussions around it. My next big question is around migrating from a self-serve managed lake. Why should I choose Iceberg over Snowflake? So, Ryan, do you want to start? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I do think it comes down to the the flexibility and future proofing that that we've talked about. Mm. Um, so Iceberg is intended to be um, a, a centralized layer um, where all of the compute plugs in on top of it and can share. Um, we don't want people copying data, worrying about how do I lock it down in multiple mm. places. How do I uh, you know make sure that I have you know now this secondary concern of is the data in sync not just is it high quality but is it really there um you know having multiple copies is a huge tax hmm. um and and so uh i think that architecture really really um makes a lot of sense that said if you want something super simple i don't know <laughs> it's it's probably not that yet. We're working towards it, mm. um, but you know, to Martine's point, the space is extremely fragmented, mm. and we're I think trying to uh, figure out what the best practice and what that architecture looks like. Like nice. Ben's talk earlier today, where it's like, what does a database in this space even look like anymore? Um, I mean, I have wild predictions about it, but uh, I, I don't know exactly what it's going to be. Yoni? Yeah. I mean, also to be clear, I mean, like there is space for MySQL still and Postgres and these, like, I mean, this is not like data by definition is fragmented. Like you have, I mean, it used to be that you just had databases and then you have data warehouses, which maybe I'm like conflicted on, do they actually have a right to exist like f towards the future because they're sitting in that same mm -hmm. space, but like databases, no all these things are still obviously going to support use cases and are part of that 
data ecosystem that that is fed by by, by like iceberg and parquet uh, as as the source. But I mean, yeah, if you if you need something small and simple and easy, like you know, Snowflake is a good option. MySQL is a good option. MongoDB is a good option. So you have all these things that are good options. Um, but like as you scale and as you, as things get more complex, mm -hmm. I think it, it definitely makes sense to, to, to pick an architecture that's gonna give you the flexibility to, 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 to figure out how you're gonna be using your data when, when you kind of reach the limits of what, what the query engine you're using right now supports. Yeah, interesting. Matt? And so I'm actually not going to answer your question. I actually want to more, more maybe challenge the vendors in this space, open source and proprietary, that part, part of the question they need to answer is how you make your solution both iceberg interoperable, but also as good as the proprietary solutions in terms of ease of use. Because the frank fact is that like the, the Snowflake or BigQuery experience is still pretty magical. Like you just go in and open an account and then you upload a CSV and then it's like you're using, you know, Oracle or Teradata in the olden days. Like you just run queries and it works. Without the installation. Without the DBAs, without the installation, <laughs> without the hardware, without any of that. That's pretty great. And I think we're getting there with Iceberg. We're not quite there yet. But if you can like match that experience, then I, I don't think customers will have to really answer the they won't have to ask the question anymore. It's just like, oh, I can have the best of both worlds. I can have interop and I can have simplicity for my team. I, I think we really need to push toward that. Very interesting. Stephanie? Um, so I think if Iceberg were to be very successful, people probably don't even know they're using Iceberg. They're just querying their data, getting their insight. You know, they're not worrying about like what kind of um, you know, data warehouse or whatever I'm plugging into and what kind of query engine I'm using. Um, so again, I'm confused by the question a little bit, um, but I, I think that there is a reason why people like Snowflake BigQuery is because it's very easy to get started. Um, it's easy to use, but there's also a reason why people don't like it because of the vendor lock-in, because of the potentially high cost and hard to switch. But, you know, these days, Snowflake also... Um, and also other vendors are integrating with Iceberg. They're providing Iceberg Scanner, even DuckDB, for example, there is a Iceberg Scan already. You can read Iceberg um, you know, tables and soon there will be write support. So I think there's a, you know, a lot more um, just consolidation in that sense. Um, so I think probably the, the industry is just gonna move towards that kind of direction where, you know, there's not so, so much distinction between, you know, do I choose Iceberg or do I choose a particular data warehouse? Yep. Okay. Martin? Um, so I think what Matthew uh, says is, kind of, is spot on. If you think about, or you ask, why would people switch, um, uh, choose uh, Snowflake or Iceberg when, when going from a self-managed data warehouse? Mm. Well, why, 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 like, if you're running a self-managed warehouse, why would you even think about switching? And I mean, that typically comes down to, well, if you are managing yourself, there's complexity in terms of how do you deploy the, the warehouse, how do you monitor it, how do you scale it, how do you provision capacity. Um, if your workloads are variable in terms of, uh, of size, like you, you may be wasting compute, uh, capacity or, or um, uh, storage, et cetera. And it's like, well, you, you want to uh, switch to something that is, doesn't have all those complexities, so therefore you're looking for something that is simpler, right? And and if you're considering a system uh, like a, a managed service like Snowflake or uh, Galaxy from Starburst or Tabular, or like you're looking at, well, what do those things give me over a self-managed system, mm -hmm. right? If if I don't get the ease of use, the ease of of not having to think about it, uh, then the, the 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 equation doesn't doesn't compute right um so so i think that's that's the key it's like you have to have a system that is so easy to to manage and to deal with that you don't have to think about it um i also think so the the question of comparing snowflake with iceberg i think you're comparing a bit that is apples to oranges because i mean iceberg is a table format it's just about the uh, data management mm -hmm. snowflakes uh, has a, a lot more around uh, on top of it so you need to be talking about something uh, like you need to be comparing like iceberg with Trino, iceberg with More Galaxy, time. or um, so. And I think there are there are, depending on what you what you look at, there are a number of advantages like like uh, some of, 
And some, someone else said, there's the openness and the you're not locked into a specific technology that you cannot control. Like if you want to do certain things, like with Snowflake, you may end up having to replicate or copy your data multiple times. And yeah, all, all those those uh, aspects of uh, managing your data, like with an open system, you have more flexibility and you have a bit more control. Like you can venture out a little bit if you there's part of the use case that is not well supported. You can, I know, uh, you can contribute to the iceberg uh, project and specification. You can contribute to Trino and, and push mm -hmm. for the for those uh, t type of workloads. Okay, uh, this is pretty uh, interesting. Anything else anyone wants to add? We can jump on. To, I have some questions for Yoni, Ryan, and um, Martin as well. So, why did you choose to build on or integrate with? Iceberg or the other table formats like for Ryan, obviously, I understand. <laughs> but Yoni, do you want to yeah. start? So, I mean, so first of all, Iceberg is a very simple table format. Like in the end, it doesn't make a lot of, like it's a very narrow spec. So that's a big advantage. It means that, that it's both easy to integrate. It's also, it also means it's going to be able to iterate in the future and engines are going to be able to broadly support it. Whereas like other table formats are more complex. Mm -hmm. um, so, so it just means there are going to be more bugs and more issues and more like gotchas and things that don't exactly work the way you expect it. Whereas with Iceberg, you can more kind of coerce it. And we've seen that because like there have been things that haven't worked for us and, and we could actually work around them pretty easily because of how this, how the spec is. So I think it's a pretty successful spec in that regard. Like, I think they're all pretty similar. Like they're not, they're solving the same problem and it's not that complicated a problem, but, but I do think that it's like, it's a good solution mm. and also it has all the features we need so that's an important point like if you don't have good merge on read support you can't do streaming that's just like like you just can't so so you need to have good merge on read support um and, and iceberg does so it's like it's a complete format in that sense that it does what we need it to do okay. I, I think one of the things that the iceberg community has done well over the years um is actually choosing which problems to work on um, so from the, the very early days, we wanted to solve the usability challenges, like the, you know, inability for us to rename columns was pretty ridiculous. And all of the things that you had to do in order to clean up data spills because you didn't realize, oh, you can't do that. Um, so that's the kind of thing that we focused on. But to your point, like you really have to make a spec very narrow because you want everyone to be able to implement it and implement it correctly. Mm. Easy and simple. Martin, Stephanie? Um, so, well, uh, in mostly work on Trino. You know? So uh, it's a query engine. So we have to integrate with any table format that anyone's using. Otherwise, it becomes, Trino becomes less useful, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we su uh, Trino supports Iceberg, but it also supports uh, Hive and Hoodie and, and Delta Lake. Now we've seen, a lot of uh, momentum in, in in the Asper community. Like if you look at the project, at, at the Trino project, most of the uh, activity that's going on in in terms of integrating with uh, table formats and supporting more advanced features have to do with Iceberg. It's, it's a broader community. There's, uh, I mean, all the all the folks from Tabular are involved. There's, we have um, developers at Apple, at uh, Netflix. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and a number of other companies, everyone kind of uh, jumping in the project and, and pushing. So it's like just the natural course of, uh, of things. So, um, but I do think like Iceberg has, I mean, as, as um, Ryan was saying, it's a very narrow spec. It's a, um, and it's, it's somewhat, it's kind of conservative in how uh, they've been adopting or making changes to a spec, making sure that the changes satisfy the uh, the problems that that are, that are trying to be solved, uh, which is a good thing. You end up uh, one of the problems with Hive was that it was a patchwork of different features that people just threw in there. So it basically, makes Iceberg a much more solid uh, foundation, and I, th I think it's, it's a it's a pretty pretty good technology. So. Okay, awesome, Tiffany. So MotherDuck is also a lightweight, easy to use data warehouse. So we have to support, I'm not have to, we want to support <laughs> Iceberg. Um, and I think we, 
uh, went with Iceberg first, um, other than the other formats such as Delta Lake or Hoodie, because of the adoption. Yeah. Um, there are tons of people using Iceberg. People really like it, and they're basically asking for it. And um, back in BigQuery, we also had support for Iceberg. That was also the first format that was chosen. Um, so you can see a trend over here. Um, so I think, yeah. We, we just want to be able to, you know, collaborate with people, allow people to collaborate um, using Mother Duck, essentially, and, you know, make us not um, obsolete. So we have to, we yeah, we definitely want to support Iceberg. And like I said, soon, you know, DuckDB will even add more Iceberg features mm -hmm. um, into its core support, uh, including write and more complicated uh, scenarios. So we're very, very much looking forward to uh, those kind of integrations into Mother Duck. Okay, that's awesome. All right, uh, so what I'm hearing is obviously easy to use uh, demand uh, for sure in the momentum of the community that keeps Iceberg uh, moving in, in the right direction. So that's awesome. What I'm gonna do is open up questions for our audience. I think we have a few minutes more. So we have opportunity for any questions uh, that audience has, please. It, is it like it's like what you're trying to choose between is this flexibility and affordability. And the affordability comes when the trend is identified. Because they're going to make it cheaper because now you, you, you're putting yourself into the set. You don't have the flexibility that you don't need it when the trend is identified. So they want to make more money. So they're going to pick the cheaper system until that flexibility is needed. Seem like you guys are really just searching around for the, the trends until the trend is identified. You need the flexibility. So this iceberg is the best one to choose because you can you can customize it. But when the trend is identified, who cares about customize? I want the most efficient, cheapest thing to get me to because everybody's about profit, right? So even if they could afford it, they don't want to spend more. They want to identify what they need. They only want that. They don't care about the flexibility. Well, I don't think that those two things compete, though, because I, like in the end, data lakes are the cheapest. And if you give someone your data, then they once like I'm thinking of like the Oracle days. OK, so like you paid twenty seven thousand dollars per core. Like that sounds like an insane price now. And the reason they could charge me that much is because they had my data. I literally had no choice but to keep paying them and buying more cores as I need more compute. Once you give someone their data, they basically have a monopoly on you and they can set the price however they want. Mm -hmm. If they don't have your data, then costs like vendors are going to tend, the costs are going to tend down to the cost of the infrastructure, basically. So like that's kind of bad for us in a way as vendors, because like the pie is going to get smaller and smaller as it becomes cheaper for the customers, closer and closer to the cost of like basically the EC2 and S3. That's, that's in the end the benchmark that people are going to do and do it like, OK, I'm willing to add a bit in order for it to be easier. But they're not going to pay you a lot more. So and data lakes are the cheapest and they give you flexibility. So you're not you're not really compromising here. Uh, I yes, I, I agree with that. I think um, data lakes and this this sort of lake house architecture, if you want to call it that, is a step function cheaper um, for that reason. Um, it also gives you that flexibility and the flexibility then you know, sort of drives down the cost of compute on top. Because if something is really expensive, you can move to a, an, an alternative that's maybe, you know, five seconds instead of three seconds um, to run that query. Um, there's also a, another cost associated with it, which I think is the, the current blocker, which is like switching costs and, and expertise. So how do I actually deploy this and run it in, you know, in practice? And that's where I think we, we disagreed on the first question, which is like, well, are we really at a place where it's the easiest thing to set up and maintain and, and put into production? I think that is, to your point, like what is going to be driven down? Because now I think this trend of shared database storage exists, um, but shared database storage is, you know, sort of 
new for all of us. <laughs> We've never been able to do this in the last 30 years. And to Yanni's point, it's changing business models of basically every uh, business in the, the data space. Interesting. Any other questions? Yep. Sure. Um, so in the past, like data lakes have sort of been this collection of like an enterprise's data and then the warehouse has more sort of been like specific use cases for the business. When you have a lake house, how do you still support these individual business cases? And what do those conversations look like with the stakeholders? Anyone? So, yeah, I mean, it's actually quite simple because the lake house, the whole point is that it's, you can easily stream data in and out. So when all your data, like think about it, the data is generated in the world and it comes in and it all lands in your lake house. And then maybe I have a use case where I need Elasticsearch because I want like semantic querying. So I, so I run a, a process that just takes it from the lake house and sends it to Elasticsearch. If I need it in a data warehouse for, again, I'm not sure like I would ever need it in a data warehouse because you get a similar service from, from the lake directly. So, but I could send it to a data warehouse as well. If I need it in a relational database, I can do that as well. So the lake house is very flexible in where it can ship data in addition to allowing you to query directly on it because it's an open format. Whereas if you're sending the data directly to a data warehouse and then I need Elasticsearch, I'm like, okay, how do I, how do, I do that? It's not, it's not very natural like, and it's not, it's not in the data warehouse's best interests either to allow you to ship the data out easily because that's kind of their lock-in. Um, so I think it's like, it's actually supported better than it used to be. Like putting aside that warehouses give you a similar scope as, as data lakes, maybe like with slightly better like small query performance, but but generally, it's going to be quite similar. Good. Okay. Chaitan. Thanks, Ryan. Um, Ryan, you may have touched on this, but there's no sort of expertise in the space. So I'm just curious if you're seeing either supply of data engineers that have these types of skill sets to be able to experiment with some of the newer technologies, or do you see a huge gap where there's still a lot to be done to educate and build those skill sets for enterprises? I think uh, Stephanie was exactly right. Um, you shouldn't care about this level. Um, this is why we've rediscovered uh, the SQL table abstraction from 1992. <laughs> we all agree on how tables work. Um, and the reason why we had this sort of distraction of Hive and, and the need for, I mean, data engineers are like DBAs, right? Um, that, that's always a function that you'll need. But without a proper table abstraction, we put way too much responsibility on data engineers. We said, you need to care about how large the files underneath this table are. Why? <laughs> so part of what we're doing with Iceberg is restoring that abstraction, saying like, you know what, run any DDL statement on this, it's going to work. Uh, we are going to guarantee transaction semantics so that we can build a service that goes and compacts the data files so that you don't have to. Um, it's, it's a step forward in the architecture um, from data lake towards data warehouse. Because like data warehouses and, and proper you know, analytic databases already do those things. It's just that we had these two sort of... Uh, lineages, right? You had the Hadoop ecosystem and then you had the data warehouse ecosystem. Um, and I think that they're, they're largely converging. Yeah, I think as far as like big data engineers, I mean, the, the need for a big data engineer in general, I mean, it used to be that you needed a DBA for your databases, but what the DBA did for the most part, it was like manage finite storage, manage indices. I mean, these are things that don't exist in the data warehouse, data lake analytics space. So, I mean, if I were to use a database as a data warehouse, as an analytics store, I actually wouldn't really need a DBA. And, and then you had these intermediate years where everyone was like doing MapReduce and weird things like that. So then you had the big data engineer that, that was born there. But today, if you look at like the, the more mature systems like BigQuery and, 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 Star, and uh, Snowflake, they're not like, there isn't a big data engineer managing Big query, like I mean, they're writing queries there, but it's not that skill set. Um, so I think that's quite similar, and I think we're actually there today. I mean, like in, in this panel already, like our customers are often big data engineers just because they're the ones who are in charge of the data infrastructure de facto. But you don't need their 
their talent in order to manage Upsolver. It's easier than that. Okay, I, I think a lot of the focus still needs to be on like core data skills. And by that, I mean, how do you monitor uh, data quality? How do you set up ETL pipelines that will alert you if there's bad data coming in? How do you support business use cases? I think the additional complexity that arises with the lake house is that now you're managing more worlds, the, the like less curated data and the more curated data at the same time, whereas it does used to be completely separate worlds. But I think if you find people who are really good at data more generally, you can train them to work with specific technologies if they have a lot of really sound experience, say in the Spark world, more specifically, something like that. Interesting, good question there. Any other questions, Ayush? From an analytics standpoint, what are like what are the benefits? Because mostly what I care about is the runtime, and it won't. I, I don't care about how the data is stored per se. So, what are the benefits from an analytics standpoint? Interesting, Made, you want to take? There should be no difference in the experience. Like if uh, if we're doing things right in a data lake, you should be able to do everything you can do in a data warehouse from the analytics perspective. Um, I mean, if you're using SQL, you should be able to have all the power of, uh, of SQL uh, that you get in a data warehouse. Now, there are some things that are still uh, evolving, like, uh, for example, with, with Iceberg, um, there are certain kinds of processing that you would need to have indexes if you wanted to be able to do more efficiently. and we're not there yet, uh, and those things are improving. Um, but uh, in terms of the like, the capabilities of a SQL query engine, uh, like we are pretty much there. Um, one of the things that an open data lake gives you, though, is there are some kinds of processing that are not uh, good, uh, good, um, good fit for SQL, for instance. If you want to do uh, graph processing, like uh, you have uh, data in in tables that represents graphs of data. Well, SQL is not really well, well suited for that. If, you, if you're running a data warehouse and you want to do analytics over that type of data, well, you're stuck. Uh, if you're running an open data lake, there are tools that are specialized for doing graph type queries over that same data. So you have more options. Okay. I think that also like cost, while like as an analyst, you don't care about the cost. You just have the platform that you're using and you use it. But I mean, costs translate to quantity of data and, and variety of queries that you can run. So it's like if you're using Snowflake and, and your boss tells you, well, like, but you know, use it every odd hour and not on the even hours because I wanted to hibernate, that's like annoying. Um, so I mean, there are, I mean, that's a obviously very extreme and arbitrary example, but I mean, there are uh, both query patterns that can be uh, kind of like controlled. Like, don't run your queries every five minutes. Run them at, at, a, at a lower interval. And then also, they could tell you, don't put in this type of data. Like, I have this data. It's good, or it like has some value, but not enough value to justify like tripling my 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 costs. Whereas if you're using a data lake, I mean, often that data was already kind of in a data lake, so you're not even incrementally increasing your costs. But it's anyways much cheaper per unit. So you can. It expands your use cases, basically. It gives you more flexibility. And I think that brings up another point, which is what the analyst sees should largely be the same, but generally data lake houses retain more raw data than traditional data warehouses do, which means that if you as an analyst find an issue with the curated data, you have a better chance of being able to go back to the raw data to dig deeper into that issue. Whereas in the old ETL days, that was just all gone. Like you'd have to get access to the pipelines to have any chance of resolving issues like that. Yeah. Yeah. And retention is just yeah. directly linked yeah. to cost. Like yeah. how many months should I retain? Okay. How much does a month cost me? And then I decide. So that's, yeah. All right. We'll take one more question. Anyone? All right. Storage like Postgres or engines like Presto, Trino, Snowflake. As we march into this open world of the open lake, and you want to play Snowflake at that lake house, you're opening up the entire enchilada, right? And generally, those are multi tenant lake houses with mixed information. 
What is the future of access control systems when it comes to these late houses? That's an excellent question. <laughs> uh, I mean, okay. Um, with my tabular hat on, tabular. <laughs> no, seriously, though. Um, so, uh, yeah, typically uh, what we've done, because it makes the most sense, is you enforce security at the query layer. So if you have this monolithic database, you know, analytic database product, um, you don't do any more work than you need to. When a query comes in, you parse it, see what it needs to, to you know, access, check those accesses first thing, and then say yes or no, right? Well, if you have multiple query engines, then you have the problem that you're talking about, which is, well, how do I secure all of those query engines at once? How do I sync governance and access controls? And it becomes a giant mess. Um, so you bring in you know, another third-party system to hold the policy in a way that you can sync to the other engines. And that you know, is a, another source of the mess. So I think that the actual solution is not syncing across uh, different you know, access control schemes. It's moving that to the data layer um, so that you have a, a security solution at the data layer that can apply table and column level permissions and also um, you know not break that table level abstraction which is how you think um, and gives you like one set of access controls for everything that's a hard problem but i do think that it is a solvable hard problem um, and i i think that we have a good solution for it uh not to be that guy <laughs> <laughs> Okay, this was awesome. Thanks for doing this. Uh, thanks to our panelists for doing this. And uh, they are around. If you all want to catch up, have any questions, uh, you can reach out to them. Thanks once again, and thank you for all the questions.